you open your Bibles to Esther chapter 5, I want to remind you as I remind myself that your perspective is severely limited. Now, we may not realize that. There was a recent article published a few years ago in the MIT Technology Review entitled, How Far Can the Human Eye See the Flame on a Candle? That's an interesting question. Now, there was much speculation, and two researchers from Texas A&M responded. They wanted to do an in-depth research in response to some speculation. And in fact, what they found is that people on the Internet were making claims that the human eye could see the flame on a candle about 30 miles away. And of course, if it's on the Internet, it must be true. And shout out to my friends, bonjour. There's only one problem with that. With the Earth's curvature, the horizon falls off at about 2.9 miles. So you would have to be pretty tall to see 30 miles away. So the researchers did some analysis. They considered use of binoculars and did measurements based on the use of telescopes and some of the huge telescopes that are available to scientists. And what they discovered is that the average human can only see the flame on a candle about 1.7 miles away. That's with nothing obstructing your sight, no other light, and just darkness. That's about how far you can see. Now, let's be honest. That's not very far at all. Can we together be honest and transparent and admit that our perception and perspective is severely limited. Now, we struggle to admit that. In fact, I struggle to admit that I need glasses, and we struggle to admit we have limitations. But it's been scientifically proven that we can't see standing flat on the earth past three miles because there's nothing to see. Yet we struggle also to admit our own limitations spiritually. We don't like to admit that we are severely limited in our spiritual perception. We like to think that we can understand all things. Everything always makes sense to us. We don't want to admit to others around us that we may not fully comprehend or understand what's going on in our life. We don't want to admit as mature believers that our sight, that is our spiritual sight, may just be limited. That's where we should start today, though, is with an honest assessment, an honest confession that we have severe limitations when it comes to our spiritual perception. That is that we can't always see or understand the hand of God. Now, we like to make confessions. We like to make statements, and I usually refer to that as church talk. We want those around us to think that we can perceive and that we can understand. But I hope that we would start by being vulnerable and transparent and saying, there's sometimes it just doesn't make sense to me. There's sometimes when I cry out, why me? There's sometimes when I say, I don't understand. There's sometimes when I say, God, where is your hand? Where's your will in all of this? Maybe we could start by being honest. Being honest that our perception is severely limited. When things are going on around us, we can't always understand or know exactly what God is doing, but we know this, we can confess that He is working all things, not some things, all things together. That is, He's weaving together all the failures, the successes, all the knowns and unknowns, all the visible and invisible. He's weaving it all together for our good and His glory. And while we might not see his hand, we know that he's always actively working. God is never passive. He's always actively working. And as we come to Esther chapter 5, I want you to remember that there were hundreds of thousands of Jews living at that time who did not have any clue or idea what was going on in the temple. You're reading the stories if everybody understood as if they were watching it they were binge watching it that night, saying, okay, this is all going to work out. I can't get enough of the episodes. I'm going through as fast as I can. I want to see how this all plays out. I'm going to jump to the last one, work my way back. That's not how it worked. They had 11 months. 
and the world was going to come down upon them. The strongest army, the strongest nation, the superpower of the world would come down upon them in 11 months and crush them, and they had no idea what was happening in the palace. I'm reminded of Hebrews chapter 11, as that author recounts the faith that we see throughout the Old Testament. As we hear now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. We're beginning to get a glimpse to understand what faith looked like. Faith isn't based on knowing everything, seeing everything, understanding everything. Our faith is increased when our knowledge of the object of our faith is increased. We don't always have to see God working, but our faith is in a God who never rests, who never sleeps, who never grows weary. There's not a moment, there's not a millisecond in your life when God isn't actively working. You may not see it, but God has people everywhere at all times bringing about, carrying out His perfect will. But I have to admit, my perception is severely limited. Sometimes when we read the Bible, we only consider the actors in the narrative and then ourselves. For some reason, we seldom consider the original audience that this was written to. This wasn't a play-by-play. -play. They weren't hitting the replays and analyzing it. This would have been an audience that lived several generations later, more than likely Nehemiah's day. And as they struggled to rebuild, as they struggled to do God's will, to persevere through opposition and persecution, they're receiving a word. I can only imagine as they stood there on that wall with a trowel in one hand and a sword in the other, being discouraged as the nations around them wanted to wage war and stop God's work. I can imagine the discouragement that must have set in, the questions that they sought answers for. But here we have a book reminding them, when you can't see it, when you don't know it, and I dare say even when you don't feel it, God is still working. God is still active. And He's active and working in the most unlikely places through the most unlikely people. Who would have thought that as this great world power decided in an arbitrary way to destroy and execute every Jew in the world, that God had already had someone in the palace who was going to have an audience with the king. Wow. Isn't that just like you, Lord? You aren't limited by what I can see. I thank God this morning that he's not limited by what I see and by what I know. And sometimes I'm going to be honest with you. I'm thankful that I don't know all that he knows and see that all he sees. I don't know that I can understand the magnitude of it, let alone appreciate or consider it. I'm like one of his spoiled children that is always whining and crying, saying, why me? Give me more. That's not good enough. I don't like that. You've never had kids. But anyway, that's how we are. We can't see or even know everything, but we do know this. We know in the one whom we trust. We know whom the one we've put our faith in. He's demonstrated his faithfulness. He has shown himself to be true. And as we look at this text, I want you to see how God was using and working through Esther's courageous intercession. This is amazing. When we take a step back, just a few verses, she says, if I die, I die. See, this is the problem. When we read the text, we already know that she's not going to die. And so we want to superimpose ourselves into the text and somehow we become Bible characters. And that's a strange thing for me. But at that moment, she's not promised life. And neither are we. In fact, it was the Lord Jesus himself who said in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 9, they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death and you will be hated by all nations for my namesake. Yet we're surprised when unbelievers hate us. We're shocked when they hate the gospel. We don't know what to say when we find them repulsed by the name of Jesus. But yet this is what he told us. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 22, he says, And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. 
but the one who endures will be saved. You see, that doesn't sound like a very appealing promise. That's why we're not seeker sensitive here. Our, our responsibility is to equip the saints to go out and do the work of the Lord. Our responsibility here is to provide you with an explanation, with a demonstration of the power of God that the object of your faith would only be the Lord Jesus Christ. And as your faith grows, you would go out into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in that his house might be full. We are going to be about the Savior. Listen to me. My prayer is that God would silence the skeptic, save the sinner, and sanctify the saint. That is our work here. That's what we will be about. If we die, we die. We're not promised life. In fact, we've been promised death. We've been given a promise that far surpasses this life. And that promise is a promise of eternal life. A man or a woman who has already died isn't scared of death because they know what awaits them in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, they will be changed. They will put off this temporal to put on the eternal. They will set aside this mortality and put in immortality, and those eyes that were limited and perception will behold Christ in all of His glory. That's why Paul said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. My perspective is limited now, but there's coming a day. There's coming a day. Ladies and gentlemen, God has called you to be courageous in your intercession, but He's not promised you that you won't die for it. I think about it, it was 466 years ago this week, February the 4th, 466 years ago. Now, many of you will recognize the name William Tinsdale. Well, what you have in your hands this morning is a product of his work. That is, he died striving to provide us an English translation of the Bible. He was martyred for that. And he handed off his notes. The work wasn't completed. He handed off his notes to a man who had formerly been a Catholic priest. His name was John Rogers. He handed those notes off, and Rogers, under a pseudonym, began to complete the work so that we would have an English Bible. We'd have the translation of God's Word in our own native tongue. 466 years ago, this coming Thursday... John Rogers was burned at the stake. He was burned at the stake because he refused to renounce that a man is only saved by grace through faith and not of works. He refused to recant his belief that the Bible alone was the Word of God. And as they walked into that fiery flame that awaited him, as he walked by, they, the scoffers mocked him. The Roman priest called him to recant. As he walked by his wife and his 11 children, the 11th he had never met before. That was the first time that those eyes would see that young child. And as he went to be burned, they asked him yet again to recant. He said, that which I preached, I will seal with my own blood. Seldom do we hear talk of great men and women like John Rogers who embraced the fire of persecution that we would have the gospel in our own language. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm not telling you that I know the future and how it will play out for us individually or particularly, but there may come a day when you are called upon to testify to the grace of God and it may cost you everything, but you've been given a greater promise that goes far beyond this life and far beyond the pleasures and the temporal nature of this life. As those flames engulfed John Rogers on that day, I want you to remember the impact that such a testimony had that his wife and his children knew that he was a man of caliber who stood for something. We have something worth dying for, thus we have something to live for. If I die, I die. Stop being surprised that the world hates the gospel and the church. Stop being caught off guard when they ridicule and mock us. If we die, we die. Notice she goes in. 
She puts on her royal robes. She's identifying herself with a place of privilege. But it's interesting when we contrast the clothing that she's putting on to the clothing that Mordecai is wearing. Is it not? And he's still covered in sackcloth and ashes. We wouldn't think of that as clothing of privilege. We see her being clothed in a privileged position. I think there's something very interesting as we look at the contrasting. She does so to win favor from the king. Mordecai does so to demonstrate the favor of a greater king. See, you don't have to put on anything to impress God. In fact, I dare say that our great king isn't impressed by our best. If he was, we wouldn't need the cross. What impresses God is a humble heart, a contrite spirit, someone covered in sackcloth and ashes. But we see here also that there's a sharing of the workload. Not everyone can be an Esther. Not everyone is going to be put in a position where they can make intercession with the powers to be. Some of us will be called to quietly in our prayer closets to cover ourselves in repentance, crying out to God, saying, God, only you can save us. There's a workload here, and we share it together. We recognize that God has appointed some people in positions of influence and power, but those positions will never trump the position of influence and power you have in your prayer closet. We see her covered in those royal robes, but at the same time, Mordecai is covered in sackcloth and ashes. Isn't that just like you, Lord? You've got your people everywhere, even though we couldn't see it. Remember, they couldn't see this. The audience to which this is written doesn't know it, but she's granted favor. We know the story. She's granted favor with the king, but with what king? We get preoccupied with Xerxes, also known as Ahasuerus. We're preoccupied with his favor. But is that really where the favor comes from? It says, and she received favor in the sight of the king, but yet whose eyes were it that were upon her all the time? Who was it that knew her even before she was born? Who knitted her together in the womb? Who was it that ordained all of her steps? The same God whose eyes are upon you. You have favor in the sight of the king. You know, they say that favor ain't fair. Maybe more appropriately, favor isn't fair, but I think you understand what I'm saying. Favor ain't fair. Now, what we do is we read up to the story and we're like, well, I see the ideal candidate. But what you don't understand in the Jewish mind that pretty much everything in her life was somewhat scandalous. I mean, she's marrying a Gentile. She had to try out for the marriage. I mean, the scandalous nature of everything that's unfolded in her life up to this point makes her, in our eyes, the wrong person for the job. But our eyes are focused on her and not on the one who had ordered her steps. See, I want you to understand that her past was of no, it was of no measure in her present. See, I think you need to understand something. Someone who is bringing up your past sins are themselves living in present sin. Anyone who's preoccupied with what you've done in the past or how you did it or how long you were there as themselves, they are themselves in sin today. Because they're preoccupied with measuring you against themselves. And what you see is envy and jealousy. That's what we would have looked at in Esther's life. She's not the right person for the job. If you knew her background, the things she had done, where she had been, how she got there. She's the worst person for the job. Yet she was exactly who God appointed for the job. And the same is true with you. You say, you don't know what I've done, where I've been, how long I've been there. But God does. And it's not my job to throw your past up in your face. Why? Because in Christ you're covered in blood. Only the evil one's out for blood. A believer recognizes each other as covered in blood. We see the grace of God bestowed upon even the worst sinner. She's willing to die. She's granted favor with the king. She puts on her royal robes. 
This is a defining moment in our life. Many of us have these defining moments. We think that our failures define us. Or maybe in our arrogance, we think our success illustrates who we are, and that's not true. We see in her intercession a willingness to be humble, a willingness to recognize her own temporalness, a willing to recognize that she's ultimately not in control. This was a defining moment for her, and I want to remind you that the defining moment in your life was not your failures, it's not your successes. It's the moment you gave your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the preeminent defining moment in your life. There's no other moment that can compare. That is the most significant moment in your life. That's the defining moment. It defines everything. It changes and transforms your life. I don't want to talk about my past. I don't want to relish in my sin. I don't want to amplify the depravity that Christ found me in. I want to magnify the majestic name of Jesus, the one who redefined this sinner's life. That's a defining moment. That's the defining moment in your life. Nothing will ever can compare. We see this is a defining moment for her when she identifies with her people. We also see God using this perfect plan. This is interesting as we look into the strategy here. God is working and using this perfect plan. The king says, I will give you anything you want up to half of my kingdom. That's an idiom. We see that also in the New Testament. It was Herod who offered to give half his kingdom, end up having to give John the Baptist's head. And so it's a statement to say, whatever you want, I'll give to you. It's interesting. When he says that, I want you to understand we've been contrasting Ahasuerus with the Lord. He can't give her what she wants. Did you ever think about that? He can't give her what she wants. The narrator's already said the edict is irreversible. He cannot give her once. The most powerful man in the world, and it all is bravado. I'll give you half of my kingdom. And we've already seen how many provinces, how much money, how awesome and amazing he is. I mean, there's nothing he can't have. He gets whatever he wants. He says, I'll give you up to half of it. You just name it. But there's one thing he can't give her, the salvation of his people. See, even in this, we see that Ahasuerus is weak and he's foolish. No man or woman, child or leader, can give you what only God can give you. There's something reserved that only God can give us. Only God can give us the meaning that we seek. Only God can fill the void in our life. Only God can save us. I think the message is coming in here that Ahasuerus thinks that he has all the power, all the ability, but yet we find Mordecai and the Jews, they aren't saying that. They're saying that we must cover ourselves in sackcloth and ashes. We must fast, showing our utter and complete dependence upon God. She's not dependent upon King Ahasuerus. She's dependent upon another king. That's what we see here in this perfectly laid plan. But I think it's interesting that she asked for more time. You know, sometimes silence is beautiful, is it not? When you're being attacked by a fool, just be silent. Oh, there's a lot to be said about that. Just be silent. That's what she's doing. She's just waiting. Giving ample time for Haman to prove that he is the perfect fool. So what we find here, the first feast that she offers is for King Ahasuerus or King Xerxes, and Haman is an invited guest. And the second feast is going to have just Ahasuerus and Haman, but both as, as if you will, sitting in that seat of honor. In some respects, we see here Haman interprets it as that he's equal to the king. Only he's the only one invited to the feast. He is so special. He's so amazing. Isn't that just like the fool? He recounts all the things that make him great and you horrible. Just let him talk. Just give him time. Oh, he's building his own gallows as we speak. Oh, you've worked with someone like that before. You know someone like that. 
They're criticizing everybody. They're, they hate anybody and everybody that doesn't think like them, look like them, talk like them, vote like them. They can't stand everyone except for themselves. Have you ever met someone like that? All they love is themselves. Don't argue with them. Just let them talk. That's what we see here. She just needs more time. Why? Because God was providentially moving and shaping history. We may hear those who foolishly attack the church, who, who mock the gospel, just let them talk. Let them go on and on. The more talking they do, the more foolish they sound. We are going to spend our time focused on preaching the gospel. We don't have time to argue with fools who mock. Our time will be invested in preaching the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ and Him alone. Do you want to know why? You say it's because you don't love the fool. No, it's because we love the fool, and the fool needs to hear the gospel, not us arguing. The world, the markers need to hear the gospel, because that's the only thing that can save them. You say, how do you know that? Because that was you, that was me, and someone preached the gospel to this fool. Someone made Christ known to these fools, and I'm willing to be a fool for Christ because it's by the foolishness of preaching that we find men saved. Wow. I went from being a fool to being a fool for Christ. I'll take it any day. We see this perfectly laid plan. She has the two most powerful men in the world following her initiative. That is amazing. I don't understand the power that women have. I never will, but yet it's being executed here fully. Ladies, you'll have to divulge your secrets someday. Write it in a book so the rest of us can catch up. We understand. I'm just walking around like a bumbling idiot most of the time, not understanding anything. Say, yes, where do you want me to go? That party? I'm there. Where are we going tonight? I don't know. And <laughs> I just get in the car. <laughs> the power that you have. But anyway, we see it here see it on display, but really what we see is the power of God. We see this perfectly laid plan, and she's allowing time for Haman to overstep. That's what's happened. And now here he comes, with all of his arrogance and hatred, which ultimately will lead to his destruction. Here he is, finally back on the scene, our favorite politician, announcing to the world how great he is, and it's always someone else's fault. He's just amazing. If you only knew how amazing he was, just keep listening. He'll tell you over and over and over again. He gets his friends together, has a press conference. I am amazing. I'm amazing. And one person stands up and says, you're really not. Now you have to blame the other person for that. That wasn't me. It was Mordecai. Uh, he won't bow. If he would just bow at my feet, we'd have utopia. I know you can't picture that at all. I know you can't relate to that at all today. I get that. But if you just bow, <laughs> it all work out. We haven't read it. You haven't read it. Just trust us. We'll vote on it. You bow. We've got it. You've never heard these things before. I don't know where you are, where you've been. We hear this a lot. Haman, he's back on the scene having his press conference. We can't wait to hear from you, Haman. What do you got to say? Same old message. I'm great. You're not. I'm smart. You're stupid. Listen to me because you don't know how to live your own life. Nope, you've not heard that. So, But here Haman is. He's on top of the world, verse 9. I mean, could it get any better? He's got everything. I mean, he has everything one evil politician could want. His heart is full. What else could a man want? <laughs> he has everything. The power, the authority. He decides the winners and the losers. He decides who lives, who dies. He's got the money. He's got the authority. He's got a pen. He's signing stuff. He's writing stuff. He's signaling stuff. I mean, here we go. Let's hear how great you are, Haman. I can't wait. He gets his little click around him, little entourage, his friends. Now, what you'll find out, I love this. There's some irony in that his friends all take off later. But anyway, his friends are there now while he's in position of power. He's got money. This is his posse, if you will. And uh, he's on top of the world. He's untouchable. No one can touch him. No one. No one could touch this evil politician. He, in his mind, and his worldview, his position, his power, his prestige, his money was evidence of divine favor. I mean, the gods were showing their favor upon him. 
Now, we would look in that view of the world that they had in Persia, and we'd look at Esther and Mordecai and say, apparently there is no favor that resides upon you. You are doomed. Your God has abandoned you. He has forgotten you. He has left you. The reader would have recognized those two messages running through. In the ancient Near East and the Persian worldview, Haman was the one who had received divine favor. The God's hands were upon him. Oh, little did he know that those who were covered in sackcloth and ashes, those who were in repentance, striving out, calling out to the name of the Lord, they were the ones who received the divine favor. Oh, he would receive something divine all right. It was just a matter of time. Haman was on top of the world, but his obsession and hatred of one man drove him to his destruction. The Bible is very clear. How could you say you love God whom you have not seen and hate your brother whom you have? The Bible is very clear on that. Hatred and obsession will drive a man crazy. Your hatred for someone else is allowing them to rent space in your mind that they haven't paid for. You're giving them a place in your life they do not deserve. And what we find here is the story over and over and over that pride comes before destruction. His pride and arrogance led him to a place that he thought that he could bring down God's people. And what he would find is that you can't stop God and you can't destroy his people. His work will continue regardless of the scoff the mockers, and, and it all is happening in light of those who hate and those who are obsessed. That's why the psalmist says, Thou preparest the table before me and the presence of mine enemies. We've often skipped over that line as we hear that great psalm, that great psalm that declares that the Lord is my shepherd and that he is chastening me through the valley. But we also recognize that that table of abundance that he provides and he prepares is in the presence of our enemies. Wow. Isn't that just like you, Lord? Mm. Mm. Just let him keep talking. We're going to preach the gospel. Jesus said, bless those who curse you. Pray for those who persecute you. Let us be a light that can be seen far beyond 1.7 miles. Let us be a light that goes beyond the curvature of this planet. Let us be a light that surrounds this globe with the good news of Jesus Christ in the face of fierce arrogance and hatred and opposition. Let us be those who stand in the gap and say, that's right, I'm not surprised that you hate me. Jesus said that would happen. I'm not caught off guard, but here's what's going to surprise you. I'm going to pray for you. That's right. And when you curse me, I'm going to bless you. That's what's surprising. That's what's shocking. You say, I'm shocked by Hames. That's what happens. Here's what's shocking. Here's where they have no category, no answer, no response. Is when God's people start praying for the Hamans of this world. They have no category for that. They expect you to tweet and post, argue and fight. But what they don't expect is us to be covered in sackcloth and ashes interceding on behalf. Haman wanted to be adored. He wants people to love him. And so he goes on and shows us that he's truly the perfect fool. That's what he is. He's the perfect fool. Look at all that I have. But it's worth nothing. It means nothing to me as long as Mordecai is alive. Oh, you poor baby. And we remember, as we hear his wife telling him what to do, we're reminded of 1 Kings 21, are we not? Ahab wanted Naboth's vineyard. And when he wouldn't sell it to him, he went home like a baby and just wept. Didn't want to eat, you poor thing. You entitled snot-nosed brat. But I want it too bad. Naboth said, this was my ancestors gave me. I, we worked hard for this. He doesn't care. Again, I, there's nothing you've ever heard before, but we'll take it anyway because we want it. We'll use eminent domain if we have to, but we'll take it. It's ours. And his wife, now Jezebel, where that name just still reeks in our ears, tells him we'll just kill him. And then you can have it. 
Here we see another Jezebel. We hear of another Jezebel later in the Scriptures who opposes the church. There's always a Jezebel who hates the church and wants to see the church die, but her time is limited. She says, build an instrument for the death of your enemy, and he does that. He's glad to do it, 75 feet high, a demonstration of his arrogance and pride. I mean, you, you could have hung a man on something really 10 feet off the ground. That would have gotten the job done, but he's at 75 feet high so everybody can see how amazing he is. You don't mess with Haman. What Haman didn't know was there was favor from an unnamed king that was resting on his people. You can't always see it. You don't always understand it. You don't always perceive it. You may not fully grasp it, but his favor resides on his people. Let them build the instruments of our death. Like John Rogers, we will embrace it if that is God's will. Let them taunt. Let them, let them stand in their self-exaltation as they mock the people of God. But what they don't know is they can't see because they can't perceive the favor of God that resides upon His people. That's right. These eyes can only see a flame about 1.7 miles away. I am limited in my scope. But there's coming a day when these eyes will behold the glory of God in the Son of God. There's coming a day when I will see what favor looks looks like and how it rested upon my life. I will understand. I will comprehend. I will have full perception of what I didn't deserve, but what I received. That's what the world can't understand. They don't always see it as they see us as a no good Bible toting, listen to me, Bible thumping, gun toting people. But I want you to be reminded that the favor of God still rests upon these people. And someday, these eyes that were limited, We'll see it clearly. I will understand what I only knew in part, that God for some reason chose wretched sinners to save and to make new and to stand in the gap and declare his name, even the face of opposition, to say if we die, we die. The gospel we preach, we will seal with our blood. There's coming a day. Oh, there's coming a day. There's coming a day when we will fully comprehend and understand and see with clarity exactly who Jesus is. And in that day, oh friends, in that day, I pray that he will show us all the times that we didn't see or understand or know. I pray that he'll show us on that day how he was working in the quiet of the night, in the stillness of the moment, I pray that he'll show us his hand in the midst of the chaos and the difficulty. I pray that he'll show us his grace in the face of opposition. And as we challenge, we're challenge, we challenged by immense difficulties, I pray that we will see it all. Oh, God, show us your glory. Show us your grace today. And may we say with one united voice, thank you for your favor. Thank you for your favor. As we pray, I hope you will say that now. Heavenly Father, thank you for your favor. I don't know that I have words to fully express 